our Benzili with it on the Nile and GERD issues. And there's a forum of the Nile Talk Forum, which has been there for quite some time, almost close to a year now. And we're very happy to see you every month and being uh, part of uh, this webinar. So as usual, uh, we have invited uh, speakers from different parts of the world, uh, having different topics and uh, also both in uh, Ethiopia and also outside Ethiopia, or both even we have, we had speakers on, uh, uh, on the Nile issues and transboundary water issues uh, from speakers outside the Nile Basin, which was very uh, a good experience for the speaker to share his vision, uh, the experience from outside the Nile Basin. So uh, the whole objective of this global webinar series is mainly to bring experts uh, in the Nile and transboundary uh, river issues and then share their experience uh, in terms of working together, diffusing tensions uh, in the course of sharing the common good, but also how, how you can build trust and also develop collaboration and cooperation. And this is really very important, particularly in the Nile Basin, uh, as you know. And this is organized by the FI Institute of Environment uh, here uh, in Florida, Miami, where I am, and also co-organized by our collaborators from Addis Ababa of Technology, Bardaris of Technology in, in Ethiopia, and also the Water and Land Resource Center at Addis Ababa University, and also the Nile Basin uh, Discourse, which is uh, an African-wide uh, initiative. So, uh, I will go to the next slide and introduce our speaker. Uh, it will be Dr. Samu Bogus. Uh, he's going to talk about the uh, hydro egoism and misinformation in the way of Nile and GERD negotiations, transcending the traditional approach to a long term progressive cooperation. So, to say a few words, Dr. Samu Mogus is a consultant and also research professor at the University of Connecticut, USA. And uh, Samu has been a colleague for a long time. Uh, he is a professional civil engineer and also, as I said, uh, a research professor at UConn with over 20 years of experience in education, research, and consultancy. He's currently working as an independent consultant with different international and local companies. Uh, he's also affiliated with UConn. Uh, and he was also a previous, previously he was at Arbamich University, at Addis Ababa University as a faculty and uh, was taught a number of courses in African universities, including Pan-African University. And Samu has also authored and co-authored civil water journal articles and book chapters on the water, climate, and transponder river system, especially in Albania. There is a new edited book, as you know, which came out of our uh, summer conference uh, uh, being now published by Springer, and Samu is uh, a co-editor of that book as well. So I'll be moderating this. And uh, we have some follow-up uh, webinar, but let me introduce a couple of them. There is, uh, in, on next month, July 20th, uh, at the same time, uh, Dr. Hicham el from University of Washington, Seattle, will talk about uh, in one of the topic, which is actually an outcome of his uh, dissertation research. And then once we know the title, we should be announcing it soon. Uh, and also in August, uh, Mr. Yared Bacha, uh, a PhD candidate at Baharda University in Ethiopia, will talk about on Eastern Nile system under three different water apportionment alternatives. So there is a colonial era agreement or thinking the Washington DC uh, formula, and then they could have a share. So he's going to actually compare these three scenarios and then provide some insight. And that will be on August 10. So some reminders, presentation will be video recorded. Uh, please mute your microphone for the duration of the presentation. Uh, that way, you know, we have a clean presentation. And mute to ask questions after the presentations ended. And of course, when it's time for Q&A, you can send chat to me, which is the moderator for questions or comments, or you can raise your hand and then we'll try to see how we can entertain everybody. Hopefully, uh, we should be actually able to address everybody's concerns and questions. So with that, now I'm going to invite Samu. Samu, let me see if you can uh, do it from your side or otherwise we can run it from here. 
Let me stop sharing. Uh, okay. Some of you are a co-host, and then you can uh, you can read from there. Okay. Good. Good. Is that shirt? No, we don't see it, yeah. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, good morning and uh, good afternoon and good evening if you are in the farthest part of uh, the eastern part of the world. Uh, today, I just wanted to share what I learned on the overall um, uh, Nile issues that are impacting negotiation. And I, I learned the uh, hydro equation that is self-centered approach in the region. At the same time, the uh, enormous misinformation and disinformation affecting uh, negotiation in the Nile and of course affecting public opinion. So for that, I would like to uh, provide a little bit of evidence and then uh, I'll go to uh, a evidence of uh, uh, how we can approach the issue away from uh, self-centered approach and uh, uh, misinformation. Uh, these are the contents. I would probably take 40 minutes. I, I, I hope you bear with me. I am trying to uh, include both the technical and the hydropolitical aspects of uh, Nile. Now, in 2014, <clears throat> I presented in Nile Development Forum what I call Nile Basin in one box. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have uh, known issues that we know that we can control and that we can manage. Expanding population is an issue, land and soil degradation, colonial legacy regimes that we have carried from over a hundred years. And uh, all of these issues are those issues that we know that we can control. And the region is also uh, havoc by multidimensional poverty and uh, emerging uh, demands are uh, some of the uh, known knowns that we can control, we can manage. And some of the known things that we know, uh, but it is unpredictable. Sometimes we cannot control or we are not yet there to control our climate variability or uh, uh, some of the issues coming up. Uh, we know that there is climate change. Uh, we are not yet how we can manage. Uh, we have a lot of natural uh, water in the system that we don't know how we control as, as a collective Nile. And we have also hydropolitical issues. The Nile vision elements are not objectively quantified. They are there as a subject, subjective, uh, subjective narration. Uh, this equitable utilization. What is equitable utilization? In, in an objective term, how do you quantify? These are some of known things that we, 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 couldn't, we haven't yet quantified. And there are a lot of issues presented in 2014. And the other issue is the, every time we have emerging global issues, regional issues that we don't know. And those are also obstacles and impacts for the basin. So we have a lot of baggage that we should take care collectively and together uh, to come up to what we called uh, a human, creating a human secure uh, Nile visit in that part of the world. So uh, still we haven't yet there, we have all these toolboxes, challenges in the Nile basin uh, that we should really uh, raise above uh, unilateralism and uh, uh, hero egoism. Uh, to, to just to give you an idea of uh, water, I think most of you now know 
the water source of the Nile. We have mainly two water resources in, in the basin. One is the downstream countries of Sudan and Egypt. Uh, and, and the other is the biggest swamp, one of the biggest swamp. It's all the ecosystem water use that, uh, that we know. So we have two water users and we have three water resource regimes. In, in, in. And this, as you can see, uh, from equatorial to, uh, to Egypt, vary in space as well as in time. Some of the rivers, like in Ethiopia, they're highly seasonal. It comes in two, three months, and the rest of eight, nine months is dry. Uh, if you go to South Sudan, uh, the, the okay, uh, there is a, there is a connection issue with Samu, but now Samu is going to relay his voice through a phone call, and now we'll run his slides from here. Samu, you are on slide number four. Uh, it's a continuous problem with our presentation. Uh, last time also, Alam has this same problem. Uh, I think some some kind of intrusion and intrusion is going on. Anyway, can everybody uh, hear? Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I will go uh, to the next slide uh, into the variability of uh, nine generally has a huge variability. The variability of Nile uh, sometimes exceeds the mean annual flow, uh, flow of Blue Nile. It, it, uh, as you can see in the next slide, uh, uh, it varies, for example, Blue Nile varies from 20 billion meter cube to more than uh, 70 billion meter cube. So the variability of Blue Nile alone is significant uh, as a uh, uh, it is it, uh, the issue of the issue of storage in, in, is, is paramount importance uh, in, in, in the system. Uh, now I'll go to hydro hegemony. One is simply a dominant. Can you hear me? Yes. Hegemony or hydro hegemony. Is, in, is a dominance of one country over other riparian countries in terms of in the riparian uh, or in shared water system. Uh, and this hydro hegemony uh, could be a positive hydro hegemony, as I showed, uh, sh show you briefly, and it can be a negative hydro hegemony. When we say positive hydro hegemony, hegemon countries or dominant countries may play a positive role in enhancing uh, hydro solidarity or, or shared constant within the Nile Basin, especially when sometimes uh, upstream uh, water uh, countries in the upstream position are uh, reluctant, then hydro hegemon countries could act positively in, in, in a shared way. But the counter uh, concept is that hydro egoism. Hydro egoism is a reference to the control of water uh, based on self-interest or inter international uh, uh, national interest. As you can see, I, I divided the hydro hegemony into a positive concept of hydro solidarity, whereby the riparian countries can share, uh, discuss, and solve their problems, and hydro egoism, whereby uh, countries unilaterally act and uh, go into conflict. And it's dictated by common interest in terms of hydro solidarity, in terms of human value and fraternity and, uh, and, and shared uh, human values. Whereas hydro egoism, self-interest is dictated by self-interest, you need lateralism, uh, and usually it, it leads into uh, conflict and uh, kind of a cold war uh, situation whereby countries buy for windows. Uh, condition. I can give you an example. For example, Sadiq region, uh, South Africa is a hegemon or a powerful country, dominant country, 
whereby it acts as a, pos a positive hydrohegemon and uh, these shared water uh, management concepts and uh, IWR enforcing concepts are uh, widely uh, implemented and they have a very nice protocol for shared uh, for uh, implementing uh, uh, developments based on shared concepts whereas we go to nine the hegemon uh, uh, is uh, in this case Egypt and Egypt uh, has that uh, hydro egoism uh, uh, implemented in that part of uh, Nile. So the, the hegemon countries could, could act positively or negatively. And in that way, uh, I go into uh, hydro uh, egoism. What are the manifestations of hydro egoism uh, in this part of uh, Nile? Now, there are three issues that indicate uh, hydro hegemony uh, negatively. One is uh, countries who are positioned uh, in the upstream or downstream countries could be hegemon. Uh, so position is one important uh, factor. Uh, power, military power, economic factor, uh, uh, and other uh, active stalling mechanisms and securitization or militarization of uh, this uh, is also another factor for uh, hydro hegemony or uh, uh, hydro egoism. Uh, the third factor is exploitation potential. Some countries have a potential to exploit. They probably exploit earlier than the others, and the others. So that would that gives the uh, uh, advantage to to be hegemon. So, uh, in terms of Nile, you can see the tool has uh, has put many countries in terms of uh, hydro hegemony. Uh, based on these three factors, for example, Sudan, as you can see, is uh, uh, in it's in the middle of uh, the Nile, and its power is uh, uh, medium and exploitation potential. It has also ex it has exploited. So, but if you go to Egypt, it has a higher uh, power and exploitation capacity. Its hegemonic capacity emanates from these two factors. Uh, Uganda is in the upstream part of Nile. Ethiopia is in the upstream part of Nile. So if they are hegemons, their hegemony emanates from uh, being uh, uh, in the upstream position of, uh, of the Nile. So these are the three factors uh, that dictate whether a country could be hydrohegemon uh, positively or, or negatively. Is there hydro egoism in Nile Basin? What are the manifestations? Uh, I'll, uh, these are the facts of the day, so I have to go one by one. And uh, significant harm or the long term tendency of in, in lateral policies. And, and developments in the basin. Excuse and, me, Sam, when you go to the next slide, tell me the next yeah. slide. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'll go to three to the next slide. Yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah. Okay, the third is the stalling of negotiations. There are positive negotiations since 1999, and some of the negotiations continue stalling, as this is one of the manifestations of. Uh, uh, hydro egoism, securitization or militarization of a shared water resource would be uh, one of the manifestations for uh, hydro egoism. And the, uh, the last is uh, misinformation and, and, and uh, disinformation. Uh, Basin foreclosure, as one understands, is that uh, it's when one or more than one riparent country controls or utilize a shared resource exclusively to themselves or utilize, especially utilize for themselves. So they foreclose it. They make it inaccessible to downstream countries or to upstream countries. That's what we call Beijing closers. What is the manifestation of Beijing closers in, 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 in the Nile Basin? Uh, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, uh, it, these are uh, upstream countries can foreclose the water resource so that the downstream countries could not access water. And this is what usually happens. 
And in Nile Basin, uncharacteristics of uh, other basins in the entire world, our stream countries have foreclosed uh, the Nile Basin and, and act as uh, that they, they protect their 100% utilization. So uh, these are the dynamics of basin closure. Uh, the downstream countries for close uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a policy at the same time in implementation. Next. Okay. The second is policy, uh, public sentiments, and in, in natural developments. Uh, from policy point of view, 1959 bilateral agreement between Sudan and Egypt uh, I'll show you immediately. It says, uh, the heading of uh, the agreement says, total utilization of the Nile resources. So in, in, in that agreement, it forecloses the ability of, the future ability of other countries to utilize the water resource. Uh, the sec in terms of development, of course, there are enormous unilateral developments in the Nile Basin, including, of course, uh, transferring water from the basin. Uh, you can say Toshkais, uh, Al Salam, Sanai development. Uh, also, others in Ethiopia, it, also in Uganda, there are uh, tendencies of unilateral. Uh, these are uh, hydro indications, even though it is dominantly practiced by the downstream countries. And the third is claims and counterclaims of ownership of the shared water resources. Uh, there is important uh, public sentiments as well as uh, some countries putting the shared water resource in their constitution as exclusively theirs. So they will fight to protect that shared resource. Uh, so this is, uh, and this putting in constitution has also uh, put pressure on public uh, on the government because public sentiment is towards this, uh, uh, toward this protecting what is enshrined in its constitution. Also in Ethiopia, there is a sentiment that it's going to abide by water in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. So these are elements of hydro egoism that are emerging also in Ethiopia uh, and in, in, in parts of uh, the basin. So uh, it's not natural resource, especially dynamic like water resource, are shared resource. Uh, so it has to be equitably utilized and reasonably. One cannot claim. We can claim the dam is ours, uh, but in my view, uh, these are elements of uh, hydro -egoism. Now, this is fascinating for me that this agreement, basic, okay, next please, basic foreclosure 1959 Nile Agreement between Sudan and to, uh, Egypt says for total full control of Nile. And as you can see next in the line, you see present and to fulfill present and future requirements. This is typical indication of foreclosing the future ability of other countries to utilize. And then it further says because 1929 agreement was only for partial use of the Nile. So we have to full, we have to close the circle by saying fully transition. And interestingly, interestingly, interestingly enough, this, this is stored also. I was surprised to find out this agreement between two countries is stored also in the United Nations this agreement. And while United Nations uh, is, is for uh, fundamental human rights, for equality of nations, for equality of uh, men and women, and they, they allowed to store this 1959 Nile Agreement as a legitimate agreement, uh, which uh, I, I really don't, don't understand because there are an, other nine countries. So this is one of uh, uh, the uh, indication of hydro uh, egoism in, in, in the basin. And the second, please continue, stalling of negotiation or negotiated agreements. There are ongoing negotiations and there are also negotiated agreements already that are stalled. 
uh, I, would, I, would, I would go into one of uh, very uh, robust uh, negotiated uh, or negotiations that, that, that were taking place in, uh, around 2008 and 2009, I think 2007. Th there was, uh, by Sudan, Ethiopia, and Egypt, they planned a joint multi purpose project as part of Eastern Nile. Uh, Eastern Nile uh, consortium. So they have established successfully. There is a scoping study. Uh, they they identified already anchor projects in Ethiopia and in Sudan and Egypt. And that was uh, by then uh, a scientific study was done, uh, like scoping study by World Bank. Uh, therefore, those projects were at the end of concluding. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, Egypt declined, and it was also uh, published in many uh, journals. So this is one of uh, stalling technique. Uh, joint projects are stalled. At the same time, next please, we also witness uh, a negotiated cooperative framework agreement that has been negotiated uh, for 13 years between all referring countries for comprehensive agreement has been at the end of the tail to be concluded is only that uh, two downstream countries rejected and 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 uh, and uh, withdrew this uh, agreement and this was agreed between the almost all countries except one article which is 14b article that is uh, that is articulated differently. All Nile basins except Egypt and Sudan say not to significantly affect the water security of any other Nile basin states. This is concurrent to the UN uh, Water Convention, whereas the downstream countries want not to adversely affect the water security and current use and right of any other. So you can, what does it mean? It means the current use of the two downstream countries is 100%. So if you cannot affect the 100% utilization, you cannot go into any agreement. So this Article B was progressed, and the, the, the countries agreed to form a commission to get a solution on this, and then uh, that's where the two countries uh, didn't uh, enter into continue on the agreement. So this is uh, a typical case of stalling uh, negotiated uh, agreements. And this, you can see this agreement is signed by like six countries, and there are some, some uh, countries to sign yet. Now, I think you know, everybody knows, securitization of the Nile has been there for a long time. Uh, Noor Sadat in 1970, uh, uh, declared the only battles that take Egypt to war is uh, water. Uh, recently, uh, President Al-Sisi also uh, declared Egypt water rights a national security issue. And recently, Egypt and Sudan agreed water is a matter of national security. So securitization of the Nile has uh, elevated uh, the technical matter into uh, beyond political matter and to beyond to a, a militarization, securitization. So uh, this by itself is really an indication of uh, hydro egoism in the, in the century of 21st century, uh, whereby uh, uh, we are uh, there for each other, for as a, as a humanity. Uh, I don't see any uh, uh, security, uh, national security countries in the Nile Basin treating as a national security issue. But still, of course, uh, there is a great tendency also countries trying to uh, go into that direction because it is growingly affecting their national security like in Ethiopia. Uh, so it, it will not be too late. Uh, countries would also step up the Nile issue. That, Of course, it doesn't help, uh, but this is uh, a way uh, that uh, an indication of uh, countries are going into uh, their self-interest. So stepping out of national security and nationalism uh, is very important in the Nile Basin. Desecuritization, uh, depolitization, 
as uh, is an issue that we have to uh, follow. Instead, we should advance and advocate uh, human security, water for human security. Now I go to misinformation next. In the, in the area of misinformation, disinformation, I think everybody knows from different corners there are a flow of information um, that does not help any one of us. And I saw this uh, posted in, uh, in uh, one of the uh, Egyptian uh, Basi uh, webpage. It says a loss of 1 billion PCM would cost Egypt this much amount amount in terms of monetary uh, uh, we lose 130,000 hectares of land and all this uh, when i see it i went back to my my desk and i see what is the variable nature of that nine has varied significantly even after the the uh, construction of aswan dam it the nine the main nine variable is higher than the mean annual uh, flow of blue nile. It, it can go as far as 60 million. So when one claims 1 billion meter cube of uh, loss filling, uh, it doesn't reflect the hydrology of the Nile. The Nile has always been variable. Sometimes, as you can see in B, in one year alone, it, varies, it reduces to uh, almost 30 billion. In some years, you can see the beef up of more than 30 billion. So that variability, that's why the Aswan Dam has stabilized this variability. And the fluctuation of 1 billion, 10 billion doesn't affect. So this, this, this information, in my view, is a misinformation uh, to, to uh, frustrate public and to change the public opinion. And also, I have also seen a set of signs produced in Al Jazeera saying if Ethiopia fills the dam within seven years, Egypt loses 12 billion cubic meters. I don't understand the assumption behind. Uh, is it because of drought condition? Is it drought average condition? Is it now we are in the phase of continuous wet seasons and the feeling of the feeling of Nile, also many of many of us did also modeling, doesn't significantly or affect the water in, in, in the downstream countries. We have we have seen it because the Egypt has a dam that can arrest that variability. So I also find out find this is simply a statement that is a pseudo science, probably produced by uh, I don't think it's produced by hydraulic or hydraulic engineers. It is uh, one of the guys I know is environmental. So this swaying of public uh, is one indication of uh, hydro egoism in my view. And another set of science, misinformation is, it says GER does resist, GER does resist high flood. And in one of the articles, it particularly says if there is 2,005 millimeter of rain falls in a few days. This is in one of geomatics, natural articles. And I remember I, we did a certain research to produce a probable maximum rainfall in the blue line, which means it is a return period from 60,000 years to 1 million years. So what we found out later on in blue Nile to fall 2,005 millimeters in a few days, you can see a million return, close to a million return period rainfall in blue light. If it comes, is close to uh, 500 in few areas, and in, in majority of the areas, it's close to 400. And this is already included uh, in the design. Uh, the design of GERD has included probable maximum flood uh, to resist that hydrodynamic phase, uh, that comes because of this. So this kind of uh, bogus scientific presentation uh, are simply emanated not from a pure scientific view. It's simply uh, misinformation to misinform the public. 
And another pseudoscience I found out is that a girl is a dynam a dam that's prone to a seismic zone. Uh, in this, we, I think anybody can go into USGS Nile. Uh, they have a seismic map. Uh, the location of Gerd is the least uh, is, is found located uh, far from seismic zones. Uh, and of course, uh, the design also considers these aspects. And there is no any evidence that that zone is a uh, seismic zone. And the other very important issue of hydro egoism is presenting the Nile issue only as a supply issue. Uh, sorry, continue. You are there? Yeah, yeah. As a supply issue, instead of both supply and the demand management issue. If you think only as a supply issue, you are saying the whole blue, uh, the Nile in Ethiopia is like a wild watershed. There are no people. There are people who are separate from gullies. The concentration of gullies in that part of it takes space. Nile takes space in Ethiopia. It's not something that there is no place. There are more than 40 million people in Ethiopia that suffers for two reasons. One, because of the, the, the watershed degradation. Uh, the second, the rain comes erratically and for short uh, period of the season. The rest of eight, nine months is dry. So as a result, uh, it, it is focusing on the supply part is tantamount to saying, okay, send me all the water. Huh? I don't care for the people who, that lives in the watershed. There are uh, more than, uh, as I told you, four, 40 million people in the basin. And also Nile Basin is a water energy called flax basin for the entire Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, as we know uh, in literature, uh, Ethiopia is one of the driest countries. 75% uh, of Ethiopia is dry. Uh, if you can refer, uh, you can check. So it's a dry country. Only that uh, small rainfall is located in the in the Nile part of uh, the basin uh, within a short period of time. So I think there are demand management aspects that we never talk in the basin. There is a huge loss uh, in 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 in, uh, in uh, extended irrigation systems in the in the over. 30, 40,000 uh, kilometer canals in Egypt, uh, in the open water, in, in uh, evaporation in Aswan, and also in Sudan, uh, the efficiency of most of the irrigations are very, very, uh, very small. So in that case, I think that part in the negotiation, we have to include both the supply management and demand management. In that case, it, we can, we have a chance to access uh, both parts of the water for for uh, shared purposes or shared goals. How do we break all this mold? We have securitization. We have a uh, 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 problem of uh, general hydro egoism that I manifested. How do we, I think, uh, uh, the best is we have to internalize in the basin. The shared nature of the Nile force and sign and ratify CUK and proceed. Uh, that's where we have uh, an umbrella, uh, umbrella legal regime so that we can proceed from there. Uh, the second is recognize the existing and growing hydro egoism in the basin uh, and break the bull. Hydro egoism leads to conflict as we see right now. Uh, so we have to recognize this. Uh, we have to uh, expand science, scientific diplomacy. We have to base our science understanding based on purely data and purely on the science. We have to expand public diplomacy in the region, and then we have to also transfer transparently share information. In that way, we can slowly step out of uh, this uh, uh, hydro uh, mentality that we build uh, in the basin. Uh, and then, of course, there is no Rome is not built in one moon. We have to also recognize, jump into a phased cooperative agreement. Water resource is a dynamic. It's not like a border that you have a permanent agreement. It's not a mineral that's static. It is a, a dynamic 
that moves from place to place and that varies from time to time. So in that case, we have to uh, adapt. Uh, you have to have adaptive, dynamic uh, kind of uh, agreements that can be revised, that can be terminated. Now, United States are uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a debate now. The the agreement between Colo, Colo, uh, the agreement between United States and Canada on Columbia River Agreement would cease terminate in 2024 because they have that article. Purposely, they introduced that article, and then now they are renegotiating uh, based on the realities of 21st century, based on the realities of the, uh, the emerging uh, hydro climatic conditions. That is a positive reapproachment and, and a positive engagement. So it has to be a phased cooperative approach. And in the Nile Basin, we have two approaches. One, either we have uh, agreement based on water sharing, and then countries share their water based on uh, based on equitable and reasonable, and then they can do whatever they want they can uh, in that way. Or alternatively, that has been advocated for the last 20, 30 years, is joint development and benefit share. We don't have in between. We have uh, a population, growing population in the basin, and we have to recognize either we have to go this direction or this direction and progressively go into uh, agreement. So what do we mean by phase cooperation? Uh, it means that in, in order to build trust, in order to you know uh, have a cooperation engagement, first first thing is first we have GERD now feeling, uh, we have to uh, agree on GERD feeling immediately, and then reset our negotiation styles, rebuild uh, the, the, the the trust that has been eroded gradually. Uh, we have to also refrain from conflict words, misinformation. These are short-term agreements that we can proceed. Uh, and the second this, the second phase is, of course, we have to indent into long-term GERD operation and uh, development upstream uh, GERD. And of course, I also uh, advise demand management. I, I'll show you. Uh, there is extraordinary water that's located, that's wasted in many parts of the basin. And finally, I think it's very important we have one Nile cooperative framework agreement. With this approach, we can slowly build our trust and go into uh, a, a regime uh, that leads us into uh, a one economic zone in the Nile Basin. How do we do this phased cooperative approach? I just uh, conceptualized this. Uh, we have uh, the blue. The blue line is management that can in Sudan and Egypt and uh, many where many uh, there is water uh, utilization and the green down part is water utilization. What can we do? Uh, first stage we can agree and negotiate and continue negotiating on that and the second stage we can go into uh, a certain water development in upstream countries especially if it is eastern uh, I focus on Ethiopia uh, in Ethiopia and on other countries should go into management. So we they unlock management uh, water saving practices. More water would be unlocked from that, and Ethiopia can continue uh, developing its resource upstream of that. So in this way, we can create a regime that we can save more water from water management. We can also develop upstream progressively uh, without really going into aggressive development. Uh, would uh, uh, in that way uh, we can create understanding between uh, uh, countries. Of course, this cannot be fulfilled without uh, cooperative. We can also grow economic cooperation. When economic cooperation grows in the basin, the water issue becomes embedded in that cooperation, and it becomes secondary than economic ones, like in Europe or United States. Uh, Mexico, United States, Canada, their economic cooperation, collaboration is higher. So the water issue 
doesn't come as a significant uh, part. Therefore, economic cooperation should be also an important component between these countries. Uh, so we have to the countries pursue this as a facilitating agent. As I saw, I told you, water management uh, in large schemes is very important. 85% uh, of large irrigation schemes in Nile Basin uh, is open, uh, situated in a very dry and high evaporation area. And uh, some of the irrigation systems in Sudan are very low in efficiency. There is, uh, there is also a room there to improve. And one study shows by implementing different options of uh, uh, water saving uh, and uh, different uh, ag smart agriculture, for as much as 40 billion meter cube of water can be served. It doesn't mean this is all lost, but through different new technologies, we can save this amount of this is more than enough uh, for many countries in the basin. So there is a possibility to really emerge as sustainable water secure region if we can manage uh, the, dem with the demand part of uh, Nile Basin. And of course, we have to recognize there is a very high erratic rainfall in Ethiopia. And of course, in the region, uh, Egypt also remind us uh, you can use, you have a lot of rainfall. Yes, rainfall is important component of this solution. Uh, in that case, uh, Ethiopia can go into productive uh, what you call a productive rainfall uh, by enhancing soil moisture, by building distributed rainfall, harvesting dams in highland parts of Ethiopia, and other countries also. So this could be also part of the equation uh, in this uh, endeavor. And uh, there is there is a talk of uh, many years talk that uh, in the Nile. 21st century storage schemes can be envisaged. I expanded in my other talk. Uh, I think as a, as a way of starting, we can first build uh, energy and ecosystem dams in South Sudan, in Ethiopia. This is a grid. There are a lot of two only in South Sudan, for example, there are disruptive threats. Those disruptive threats, not to totally control but at least to control uh, a storage, carryover storage for some years when there is high floods, so you can have conservation dams in there. And also in the western part of South Sudan, uh, as much as 12 billion meter cube of water comes from the highland part of South Sudan, uh, only joins uh, Nile with uh, almost 11 billion meter cube of water losing. So there is a very big chance I think to, 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 to start hydropower in this part of South Sudan. Of course, I think that's what they are starting now. Uh, I have also written in one of my publications. So in Ethiopia uh, is where it, it's that's energy source. So you can uh, build or initiate the joint multi-purpose projects in, for hydropower. And then uh, in others. So there are more than 20 dams that are, that can be part of these schemes. As, as a collective uh, Nile Basin uh, projects. Okay? Samu, you can go, yeah. Okay. We are on the water supply slide. You are in the water supply slide? Yeah, then there is another lack of for you, so you got it. Okay. Uh, you want me to go back? Uh, no, no, give, give me some time. Okay. Uh, okay. Water supplies. Uh, I, we did some research on the, uh, the, the greatest aquifers of the Nubian and uh, sand aquifers in, in Egypt. We have, as you can see from different resources, there is a variability in terms of volume, but it varies from 15 billion meter cube to over 300,000 billion meter cubes. Uh, that's uh, 
uh, non renewable resource but has been stored there for million uh, million uh, million million years and one study particularly if we egypt in egypt says if we they can use 100 tick 100 meter tick of aquifer they can garner like 5000 kilometer uh, or billion meter cube of water which means if egypt utilizes this for uh, for like supplementary if they can supplement 10 billion or 20 billion per annum uh, it means it can take uh, more than uh, 250 to 500 years. Uh, this is only utilizing 100 uh, tick aquifer of it. So there is that uh, amount of water that's stored uh, in Egypt, uh, also in Sudan. Uh, the second is desalinization. Uh, I, I did in 2012 one research, what is the cost of desalinization? The cost of desalinization in, 12, in 2012, is becoming less than the cost of the municipal water distribution. As you can see, the total cost of desalination has reduced from zero point dollars per meter cube, uh, uh, including the total distribution is one point zero two uh, dollar per meter cube. Uh, uh, but current municipal water supply, as a reviewer put it, it's a Israel review, is close to three dollars per meter cube so the desalinization component in even in 212 uh, is is drastically reducing this is a graph that shows uh, uh the how the cost of reduction uh, of desalinization and municipal water cost from fresh water is increasing so i think this is also a regional opportunity we cannot see it as Egypt opportunity is a regional opportunity from the massive coastlines in Sudan and Egypt that can unlock additional water for, for the region. Finally, if we can lock up all this into a scientific platform, into integrated water resource management, uh, and uh, we have a kind of a, a control switch for managing the resource of the Nile, uh, then uh, we can uh, build a sustainable future uh, for the peoples of the Nile Basin. And this is simply to show you how each component that we discussed technically can be uh, can be integrated as, as one uh, Nile Basin management uh, platform in, in, in a kind of uh, IWR integrated water source management. What do we need? I think uh, there are two components here. One is supply management, the second is supply development and uh, irrigation management or irrigation efficiency enhancing and implementing technology. I think we need also infrastructure investment. If the countries sign CFA uh, and come up into a, a solution which to progressively, which part of the Nile they have to develop now, which part of the irrigation systems they have to improve, then I think the world uh, would be uh, would be interested to 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 uh, invest in this uh, one of I mean the oldest uh, basin with uh, conflict region so far. So if these countries could come together and have uh, a legal regime and development scenarios, then uh, the next step would be uh, infrastructure investment, development of infrastructure based on equitable and reasonable uh, uh, reasonable uh, uh, approach that, uh, dict that should dictate the Nile Basin. Conclusion, in my view, there is no water scarcity in the Nile Basin, there is only scarcity of willingness and idea. Uh, we can unlock uh, technically. We can unlock uh, water supplies. We can from managing irrigation systems, utilizing efficiency, uh, efficiently the available water resource. Of course, integrating uh, the system as one system. Uh, I think countries have to. If countries has to emerge from the current. Uh, school uh, we have to uh, recognize the injustices 
the injustices that's also emerging resentments in the basin that lead to hydro egoism. Uh, uh, and we have to also depoliticize and denationalize the shared resource and be a different approach. We can have a different independent commission, Nile Commission, that develops and manages on the basis of the science, on the basis of data, and on the basis of agreed upon models. We have to continue dialogue. We have to uh, approach uh, based on phased agreement and cooperation, and also joint investment and economic cooperation would also enhance trust in, in, the, in the basin. We have to really go into that. Uh, uh, also identify, uh, jointly identify what system-wide water supplies and gains, uh, demand management where uh, countries can manage their water resource, where there is a water wastage. Uh, sometimes you can transfer highly water consuming crops from downstream to upstream. Uh, so that is also another uh, option. Uh, hydro hegemon Egypt uh, must reject hydro egoism and play a greater role in building hydro solidarity and work to shape public opinions in that direction in Egypt, in other parts of uh, the country, uh, in the riparian countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Samu, for... Uh, sorry the... for the inconvenience. Still, my internet is down. Uh, it's very slow, I don't know why. Right? Yeah, so uh, we, we want you to be on the phone call so you can actually accept uh, questions and comments. So let, let me just try to come out of this. Let me see. Okay. I am back. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So if you want, you can actually join us. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, and we're very sorry for the inconvenience that was created because of the internet connection that uh, our speaker uh, had. Uh, so I'm very happy we were able to actually able to do it through a form relay uh, where he talked. Uh, remotely using a phone call. Now, okay, now it's time to uh, open the floor for questions and comments. Uh, as you know, Samu has touched into a few terminologies, hydro egoism and hydro uh, hegemony when it comes to uh, the use of the Nile water by the basin countries. So he touched into the historical perspective of the Nile water, the challenges that the basin is facing, facing particularly in terms of you know one using the larger share and then the others being a source of water but relatively a no use he has also touched into the issues actually post gurt you know particularly on the gurt negotiations now that the basin can particularly the three basin countries are actually facing in terms of reaching an agreement particularly in two critical areas into the filling and operations so uh, here we are now into uh, i believe almost uh, 10 years after the initiation of uh, the gurt and we still have to uh, find a common way or an agreement how to actually fill it. So this year is very critical, as you know, the second uh, filling is going to happen uh, in a couple of months and still uh, uh, countries are actually trying to talk about how to actually go around. Uh, and also we touched about the misinformation, uh, which is really uh, very, very important thing I actually to raise. Uh, uh, we really have seen it continuous uh, either uh, on purpose or maybe misunderstanding of, you know, relaying factors to the public, which we have seen it is, is a constant problem and we have to actually face it. Uh, sometimes it goes to the extent of uh, actually somehow uh, cooking numbers and actually putting it in reputable journals and, you know, publication media, which is uh, very dangerous. Uh, availability of water in terms of supply and demand also some touch, you know, we have enough water. I agree with him. There is no water security. I think there is a lack of interest in terms of agreeing on how to actually share the common good. That needs to be addressed. And that's the only way. The only way is you can, if you sit down and talk about, uh, bring everything on the table and go from there. So, and also he touched about a little bit on the needs to be done, uh, particularly in terms of bringing the three countries together. And then of course, uh, that's very important. Of course, the negotiations has to continue 
on uh, a basis that uh, there is an equitability question over here that needs to be addressed. So I think with that summary, now I'm going to open the floor for questions and comments. Now, Samu is back now, I see him. So he can take questions uh, from what he is. Any questions or comments? You can raise your hand and um, we get from there. Okay, uh, I can see Mark. Mark, you want to go? Let's make, the, let's make the very brief yeah. questions, yeah. Brief. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, thank you, Asefa, and uh, thank you, Semu, for the presentation. I just want to comment, uh, having taken part in the development of the Cooperative Framework Agreement, let me state categorically that as a comprehensive, and uh, let me emphasize a framework agreement, uh, it gives a lot of room, and it was meant to give a lot of room for negotiation of operational protocols, which means uh, all need not be covered in the CFA. And uh, what are these operational protocols? These could be some of the elements that have been covered by SEMO today, including water utilization, water sharing, demand management, inclusion of uh, cooperation elements uh, that uh, that uh, from on the basis of lessons and experiences of the Nile Basin Initiative. And also looking at the issue of extra, extra basin uh, demand and supply. Uh, we could also have a protocol on environment and climate. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done over and above the framework agreement. Let me now find out finalize by stating what is happening of late. Of late, we notice a very bellicose stance by lower repariants uh, to the disadvantage of cooperation among the Nile countries. And uh, well, we hope that uh, that bellicose stance will, uh, does not take, should not, or, sh or, or rather should not take advantage of internal developments. Of, or upheavals in the riparian, uh, riparian countries. Uh, I believe that, uh, and I firmly believe, and I think most of you believe that uh, cooperation is better than, uh, than, uh, than fighting for, for water resources. And uh, uh, finally, I think we have, inter we tend to internationalize uh, the, the issue, which is basically a basin issue. And uh, we hope that uh, we, we will return back to the basin because what is being negotiated now in terms of the GED between uh, or among uh, Egypt, Sudan, and, uh, and Ethiopia, I think uh, in the end, once the agreement is reached, I think the corporate framework agreement uh, will be in place. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Mark. This is a comment. Uh, so uh, there's nothing to respond, but uh, for the sake of time, let me go to Dr. Admasu. Thank you. Uh, I would like to congratulate Dr. Samu uh, for his presentation, a very useful presentation. Uh, he has mentioned South Africa as a good partner in transboundary rivers. I want to comment on that. Uh, that's true. South Africa is a downstream country for many international rivers in that area, but a very genuine and cooperative partner. Uh, for example, if we look at the biggest reservoir in Zambia, shared by Zimbabwe, of course, basically that is owned by South Africa, not directly owned, but the beneficiary is South Africa. And a big river basin shared is South Africa is a one owned by Leseto primarily. 
but the main beneficiary of that project built in Lesotho is South Africa. So South Africa is benefiting by working together with other re re riparian countries. Not only South Africa is benefiting, those countries which, uh, which uh, uh, mega projects are built in are also benefiting a lot. So the benefit is mutual, real, and very peaceful. I can witness this because I have worked for many years as consultant in that area. I always wish Nile Basin be in that in that situation. So I think we can learn a lot from experience within Africa itself. That could be useful for the Nile Basin. So I really appreciate the efforts uh, carried out by Dr. Sammo and I'm happy about the forum. I'm through, uh, back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Admaso. I agree with you, inter-basin or maybe outside the Nile Basin experience are very important. Uh, we were not able to find one yet in terms of you know, giving us a comprehensive presentation of what is being done outside the Nile in terms of bringing the basin countries together. Uh, we have approached uh, Dr. Gettinet. I saw him today over here to give us uh, some of the Canadian and US experience on the Colorado River or maybe only other rivers. Uh, but I agree with you, there are a lot of you know, good stories that we can share within Africa, within Asia, which are really very good. Europeans are very good in terms of working together. Uh, Nile is the most critical and very you know, uh, conflicting uh, interest by the Beijing countries but bringing this experience into this forum will be very important. If you know anyone who can give a, a presentation on this, I will be very happy about that. Thank you very much. And now I'll go to uh, the Rihun. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, uh, uh, for this uh, monthly platform. And I would like to thank our good friend, Dr. Samuogas, uh, for the nice presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, an engineer and uh, working on hydrology and all this stuff, just capturing all this on hydropolitics and the securitization process in the Nile Basin is really interesting. Uh, I would like to uh, first ask one question uh, uh, when dr samu when you mentioned about the uh, unknown unknowns uh, there was this uh, first uh, uh, row uh, that you have mentioned about the uh, global uncertainties and how it's impacting uh, the nile basin uh, i think expounding on that uh, would be really helpful to understand the dynamics in the basin as well and you know, as you know, the um, uh, development partners used to support the Nile Basin Initiative and the CFA. Uh, but when the upstream countries adopted the CFA and decided to uh, sign the uh, corporate framework agreement and set a date, uh, almost all who are involved in the ICOM, International Consortium for Cooperation on the Nile, left, and that's uh, now only. Some projects is from Germany, the European Union, and to some extent, very small one from the World Bank that is uh, the, who are engaging the Nile Basin Initiative. So, how do you see it? Why is all this happening? And is there any explanation for that? It is an unknown, unknown, as you say it. But uh, can we say something about uh, the uh, global uh, political dynamics and the Nile hydropolitics at the same time? if there is any linkage. And when it comes to, uh, uh, the way I see it, uh, when it comes to the, uh, uh, the uh, one thing that you have mentioned when you read about hydrohegemony, 
uh, about the understanding and the perception of people and the Egypt uh, saying the Nile is mine. And when it comes to Ethiopia, uh, you have also stated Abai's mine, such kind of ownership of the rivers. I think what we need in the Nile Basin is critical discourse analysis. Th that is really, really important. If you look at knowledge production and all the theoretical frameworks that we use are more or less Eurocentric. And when we use Eurocentric um, theoretical framework, sometimes we miss the point. If we look at the discursive struggle in the Nile Basin, for example, you can see the a country or uh, elites in a given country stating that the Nile belongs to them only, claiming monopolistic, uh, you know, claiming um, exclusive ownership of the Nile. And you have also the source countries, ironically, stating that the Nile belongs to us all as children of the Nile, and let us use this river to get. That's why we need a critical discourse analysis. And in that regard, I see the hydro hegemonic conception that you use and the hydro egoism that you uh, also indicated. Uh, for me, that's a manifestation of the process of politicization and securitization rather than uh, the um, rather than on politicization and securitization and misinformation as manifestations of hydro hegemony. Uh, hydro -hegemony. I believe there has never been a hydro hegemony in the Nile Basin. Yes, Egypt tries to aspire to be one, but it has always failed. In the ninth century, the direct wars uh, to expand to the source of the Nile or the proxy wars in the 20th century or the blockage of finance and the objections in the World Bank or IMF or other development partners, you know, these are attempts to remain as the sole beneficiary of the Nile. For a hegemony to exist, I believe, it should be recognized by the other parts. It, it involves dominance, I think. And one should dominate the other. And if there is anything that Egypt dominates and that Ethiopia accepts, I, I, could, I couldn't able to find one. Imagine the number of water projects that we implemented before and that we are uh, doing now, uh, irrespective of the challenges we have faced, mostly a result of Ethiopia's internal vulnerabilities, whether it's a proxy one or the financial issue. So, uh, you know, employing a discursive, uh, uh, employing a critical discourse analysis rather than the hydro hegemonic conception will help us to the conclusion that you stated in, I fully agree. Thank you, Professor. Okay, thank you very much, Zarihun. Uh, uh, so some we have a question plus a comment, yeah. So uh, according to Zarihun, there is a wish for hydro uh, hegemony, but it was not being practiced. It is maybe the weakness of the upstream countries who are not going forward and pressing in terms of developing their water resources. That's one point, yeah. So you'd like to uh, maybe address uh, one of the questions that uh, that even raised and then maybe if you'd like to comment also on uh, his uh, point of view. Samu, we can't hear, you are muted, Samu. Uh, thank you, Zerihun. Uh, it's a very critical analysis of the things. It is, it's good to go in that depth and understand the situations and to give uh, a room uh, to, you know, to, for the definitions to work in, in the Nile Basin. I am not sure that uh, there is no hegemony. Hegemony is dominance. Uh, we can see, we, we might not see directly in uh, interfering in our development in water resource, but we see a tendency of, for example, 100% control utilization, the 1959 agreement by itself promotes hegemony in that part of the world. So, so those uh, are, you know, we, it is up to us accept or the definition not accept, but there is 
a power play that wants to control the water totally. Uh, so that acts, that wants to act as a hegemon. Uh, I, I think I agree with uh, the uh, critical analysis. We can, uh, I do not want to go beyond that, but there are already literatures proliferating research, uh, literature showing uh, the many other uh, issues that I didn't include here, that there is a tendency of Egypt to act as hegemon. Uh, it's, does other Nile countries accept? That's another issue. So, but there is, uh, in terms of power, Egypt projects power. In terms of exploitation, Egypt has exploited 100%. Those are the elements that indicate. Uh, I think the other question was, uh, is that uh, unknown unknown? Yes. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of unknowns that we don't, we don't really know, uh, as, as you said, uh, you know, uh, pandemic has, has nobody expected pandemic would come and uh, affect economies or in the entire world. So uh, there are always, uh, as we go to, uh, toward the uh, 21st, uh, 21st century, uh, I, I cannot say this is unknown, but, uh, there are always humanity faced unknown unknowns that at least we are awakened in a sense that we know that there are unknown unknowns coming. Uh, that's uh, the only thing I can I can say on this matter. Okay. But, uh, thank you very much. It is a yeah, good... Thank you very much. Uh, now uh, let's go to Maria. Maria? Yes, thank you. Okay. yes, thank you very much. Um, I, 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 I want to thank the speaker for a very um, a, a good presentation and, and the information that you provided. And I just want to come back to an issue that was brought by the first uh, speaker um, in, the, in the group uh, of uh, people presenting questions with regard to um, good examples of collaboration in Africa. And he mentioned um, some uh, um, collaboration in South Africa. And, and I want to just bring to uh, remind ourselves of the um, uh, collaboration that exists in the, um, in the beginning of the Nile region for, uh, uh, within the context of Lake Victoria and um, the work that the countries that form um, part of the uh, Lake Vic um, the Victoria uh, Commission um, um, and how they work together, um, not just um, uh, in, in terms of um, uh, uh, geopolitical aspects, uh, agreements, uh, um, but also in terms of protecting the environment and uh, managing the resources. So, um, and, and it is interesting because if you um, go to their website, um, their their motto, it, uh, the motto of the Lake Victoria Basin Commission is one people, one destiny. And I think that that is the case of the lower part of, in, of, of the Nile between uh, Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia. Independently of, of everything, um, it, it's one people, the Nile people, as uh, a few, some colleagues called it, but it's also one destiny. So. Um, as, a, as an outsider from the region, um, it is, it, it is um, um, very, um, would be very uh, great if we could see that uh, the um, geopolitical aspects are um, in some way uh, being, um, bringing closer um, the countries and bringing closer the people, because at the end, like, um, like I said, the people are one people and the destiny of the river is one for all. So um, I, I really believe and that um, the, the input that these um, forums are bringing and the uh, uh, progress that it could support in terms of um, having the various um, countries talk together at the end, um, at, the, um, at the end of the Nile will be important, but we should maybe sometimes also look at what other countries higher up in the, um, in the Nile Basin are doing um, to really work together. 
So um, just um, a reminder of that. Thank you very much, Josefa. Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, some of you would like to comment on this or let's go to Daniel who is uh, waiting for us. Okay, Daniel. Hello, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the excellent presentation by Dr. Samu and also for the organizers. My question is dealing with the misinformation. We know that there are papers after papers coming up with uh, numbers which is not true and also uh, facts which are not true. And then what is going to happen if it is going to repeat again and again it would be considered as a truth and it would create some kind of hysteria in the public in the eyes of the Egyptians. And also it would affect people who are far away from the facts and then take it for granted. And then that would make negotiation very difficult in the future because it would affect policymakers' mindset. So what is going to be the next course of action if we are going to fight against this kind of flood of misinformation in the coming years or in the future. Thank you. Okay, Samu, maybe you can respond to this, which is a challenge. One of the objective of this forum is actually to bring facts and numbers and uh, you know, good data into the public. So, uh, but th th this, I agree with you, this is a bigger problem. Uh, I personally collaborated with some other people to straighten some facts and publications uh, which are clearly proven to be also useful. So I think we have to continue to talk about this. We have to continue to bring the facts and numbers, and then we have to educate the public. I mean, we are responsible for that, but some you can respond to this. I think that is the right course of action as a uh, said. Uh, but the only thing we can do is to, uh, to, uh, to publish a counter paper, scientifically fact-based paper. Last time we did a couple of papers. One is in a, a, a EOS publication that they produce. Uh, GERD is uh, not safe. Uh, it is one of reputed uh, reputed scientific communities that that paper appeared, and we developed a, a paper and and uh, we uh, we we wrote to them and they they, they actually found the truth what we wrote and then they said uh, we cannot uh, we can withdraw that paper but we cannot publish yours somehow they found the truth on our article uh, and then if we can write it as a full-fledged paper they can still accept it so in this way we can only uh, counter uh, counter publish a paper uh, that we think is factual uh, or based on actual data. Uh, second would be we have to also present in forums and big forums, scientific forums, showing some of the informations are invalid. So we have to also put it on online on web pages, uh, in, in, in different uh, forums. That's the only way. Of course, if this thing would, if the countries come to a kind of cooperation, I'm hundred percent. Uh, at least we are sure that this would subside once because this shaped public opinion, public opinion uh, would also impact on the decision of uh, political uh, or the government or political uh, elite. So at some point it has to cease and we have to come to our common sense and uh, the science and data should prevail in my view. Okay, uh, there is another question that uh, someone sent to you, but to make it short, it was uh, asked by one of our participants. And the question is, uh, how do you go about the politicizations of water sharing, particularly in the Nile, uh, which is, how do you really address hegemony and egoism in terms of uh, resource utilization or so resource sharing, which is common to the basin countries, uh, I mean, which is really very, very important a bit. Uh, but I mean, you can actually comment on that. Maybe others can also uh, chime in on this. Yeah. yeah, I think others can also comment on this. It is, there is no uh, 
a bullet point uh, for this kind of question, but I think a phased approach, uh, uh, a phased approach of cooperation is very essential. Uh, secondly, institutionalized scientific diplomacy in, in this region. There are very fine people in across the three countries that I also communicate, they, they know, they, they are fine in their pro uh, production in science. Uh, so scientific diplomacy is one way of uh, bringing uh, these three countries together. We have to start speaking, not for the sake of our countries, but we have to start speaking the science. The paper I showed you, the Egyptian paper that published uh, boldly saying uh, Egypt can save 40 billion meter cube of water from its wasteful water utilization is a noble science. They, they put forward solutions. We should also, others should also come. And then these are community of scientific practice that can create uh, scientific diplomacy that can pressure uh, the three governments or the Nile. The, se the second is, uh, the public diplomacy. There are, when I was in the Nile Basin, there are hundreds of people who were engaged in Nile Basin. We used to bring parliaments together. We, uh, there are PhD students who finished together. Uh, there are parliament, uh, there are scientific communities, university cooperations. So this we have, and also those who work in the Nile Basin together in the same office, they can create a kind of public diplomacy forum and act. They have a very well-established information, a shared information that they know together, that they cannot come out publicly and speak. These are the community of uh, uh, people that can create this kind of uh, diplomacy, you know, triggering the diplomacy so that uh, once it's triggered, uh, I think I believe uh, that would also go influencing public opinion and then uh, government opinion. And of course, we have to also give, uh, uh, I think we have to give an impression that for Egyptian public, th that there is no water scarcity in the Nile. If we can, uh, scientific community in the basin can come up with a model, a scientific uh, paper that shows there is no water scarcity. Uh, I, I think slowly uh, things would change. That's what I can say. Others can add also on this. Okay. Uh, I think everything starts first with willingness to sit down and talk and understand the challenges. Uh, if we completely ignore that part and start from uh, what you exactly would like to wish to see, then there is a problem. Uh, I have another question uh, from... Uh, Dr. Shishmenos from uh, Western Sydney University. Thank you very much for coming, Dr. Spiros. Uh, he is a UNESCO chair on conservation of riparian and delatic ecosystems and ecotourism. So his question is, can we have one of these sites like, uh, because the Nile Basin is actually experiencing disasters in terms of humans and uh, natural uh, processes. So could Nile or some parts of Nile be proposed as a UNESCO natural site in either Egypt or cross country? From memory, he says, please correct me if I'm wrong. Egypt has only one UNESCO natural site, the Wadi al Haishan, which is not riparian. Could this initiative be part of the positive hydro hegemony and further support collaborations between countries? Uh, I can also ask Maria to chime in on this as being also the chair of water security and sustainability. But will this be part of a solutions in terms of diffusion, the uh, hydro uh, hegemony and equation that actually comes along with this? Which is uh, designation of part of the Nile Basin uh, as uh, a UNESCO natural site. Uh, I don't know how does that would actually somehow contribute to this. Maria? Uh, yes, um, um, I am sure that um, some parts of the Nile basins are natural um, sites. And as you know, um, UNESCO has different designation. They have 
um, cultural site, historic sites, and, and also natural sites, depending on the program. Um, uh, the thing is that these are specific sites, uh, just like one area. And, and so um, any, any um, collaboration in the context of UNESCO will, will definitely support bringing the countries together. Um, but uh, I think that if, if, uh, if there is an interest in that, we can provide some additional information. Um, but again, it, it will, it, uh, setting aside whether it's a natural site under the man and biosphere or a cultural site, um, it will be one specific place. Um, maybe that place could be a, uh, in, in the boundary between, um, you know, Sudan and, and, and Ethiopia, for example, um, and, and, um, and create a special site there. Uh, it, it, it is an opportunity, uh, um, but I think, um, it, it will be beyond this, maybe um, the working, if establishing a, a UNESCO center or a UNESCO share in Ethiopia that works with other UNESCO centers. There's a very um, important UNESCO center, two actually in Egypt and one in Sudan. Um, that collaboration could help bringing together scientists to write more papers to, to, to show to the collaborative efforts done at the scientific level. Um, it will, will always, uh, always help. I can um, provide some more information and point to people that are um, responsible or that could support an effort to establish specific um, nature sites or um, historical cultural sites um, um, in, the, in, in the future in areas that might be of interest for um, the work that is being done to bring together the uh, three countries. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Maria. Anybody would like to comment on this? Okay, uh, now we have getting it. Getting it. Okay, thank you, Dr. Asuka. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Samu, for your uh, excellent presentation. I do have uh, uh, one comment on the topic of cooperative development and uh, one question in general on Nine River. I think uh, on the topic of uh, cooperative development, uh, benefit sharing arrangement is one of uh, the water governance structure. And uh, in the case of uh, African water course, the Senegal River between Senegal, Mali, and Mauritius is considered one of the best uh, cooperative development and uh, benefit sharing arrangement, not only in Africa, even uh, at a, a global uh, level. And this is not the only one. For example, in North uh, uh, America, the Columbia River, base, uh, Columbia River uh, Treaty between the United States and Canada, which is also considered one of the best in terms of hydropower and uh, flood control. And in Asia, I think uh, it's called, I believe, Chulda Hydroelectric Project between Bhutan and India. So there are uh, quite a good practical benefit sharing and cooperative development uh, water governance structure uh, in the world. So we can learn uh, from those as well, especially from the Senegal River between Mali, uh, Senegal, and Mauritania. And I plan to provide uh, a presentation on this topic, especially between the United States and Canada, the one of the largest uh, transboundary, my goodness, about 5,000 uh, kilometers come uh, August. If you are interested, uh, uh, you may uh, consider uh, attending it. between just United States and Canada, 5,000 kilometer transboundary. And, uh, my question uh, on the Nile River, really what bothers me is, uh, as most of you know, Nile is notorious for its cyclic nature, hydraulic variability. That means you will see plenty of water for seven years and then low flows for the next seven years. So far, we have seen plenty of Nile. I'm just curious now, 
when the law flows gonna start? How it gonna impact uh, the feeling of jerk? Uh, Samu or anyone else could comment on this. Uh, I would appreciate. Thank you. Okay, thank you, getting that. Thank you again for confirming uh, my invitation to you to come and present on the U.S. Canada. Uh, I don't know which river. Uh, are you are you looking into uh, which river basin uh, that you would like to actually come share with us? So my invitation is still open. So let me know. We'll communicate uh, about that. Thank you very much again for coming. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Samu, you can go ahead and respond. Uh, I think hydrologically, we can say not seven years in a strict, stricter sense. It could be from three to seven years. And uh, we cannot predict cert with certainty this annual uh, flows uh, or annual rainfalls. But what we can say is we can manage. That's why uh, having uh, especially many reservoirs in the cool part of the highland of Nile Basin uh, would be an abutment mechanism for, uh, for uh, uh, arresting floods as well as uh, droughts. You, you can smooth it out. But we, I think uh, we cannot uh, certainly say uh, that the next three or five or 10 years could be drought. There is obviously that cyclic nature that varies from three to seven. But fortunately, it, this is the right time. Since last year, before last year, it is exactly similar to 1996 to 2000. If you see the hydrograph from 1996 to 2000, all the flows are above, above uh, the average. So we have perfectly that kind of situation as this. Uh, I don't know, it's, it's like... Uh, God provided this this flow above normal flow over the over the last uh, two years uh, last year today this year and uh, perhaps uh, we don't know next year could be a drought but we are in a stage that we can manage I mean drought has to be managed as one dam is stores twice mean annual flow of uh, Nile. So Aswan Dam is now, fortunately, we are fortunate to have in a way Aswan that it can cater that variabilities. It can cater for two, three years. Now it is at the top of uh, its uh, water level. So yeah. we have memory, big memory to stay for some time in course. Uh, again, Lake Victoria is also uh, at its highest level. So Lake Victoria releases slowly, it has a big memory length. So there is water in the system, at least during the filling of GERD, we are sure uh, there is water in the system. And the third is, of course, Egyptian, Egypt have uh, what they call drought management policy. Uh, uh, in, in the time where they were, uh, in the 80s, they implemented water reduction from 5 to 15 uh, percent. Uh, you can imagine 1890s, 1890s is the worst dry in the entire Nile, uh, 100 years uh, history of Nile, uh, recorded history of Nile. So uh, I think uh, there is uh, a way, but one important uh, thing I would like to stress is uh, times are gone that uh, like Egypt, a country who has a very good uh, experience in irrigation, they have to step out of a very small scale irrigation, distributed irrigation system. Uh, in the Western world now, we have two or three percent feed the entire population. So the agriculture should shift into that level of moving uh, into a corporate type of irrigation because uh, all countries need to survive. I, I don't think any country wants to toil the soil, all of 80% of Ethiopian population doesn't want to stay a farmers. It is only unfortunate. So the more the agriculture system becomes modernized, I'm sure there is more water that we can access and drought could be managed accordingly. Thank you. Okay. Any comment, any other question? Okay, Zarihun, you want to chime in? Yeah, uh, Prof, on... Uh... What Mr. Gettin said on benefit sharing, 
uh, when uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's just true that benefit sharing as one cooperative way of uh, transboundary water development, we can use it in uh, uh, transboundary basins, yes. But uh, the one uh, that he mentioned, like the US and Canada on the Columbia River, or the Senegal River Basin, or the Lesotho Highland Water Projects in South Africa, uh, you, you know, they have something in common. Uh, that is, they don't have any colonial legacy to struggle with. When the Senegal River Basin countries come together after independence, they started declaring the Senegal River Basin is a shared river basin where all the countries have equal rights. That is really, really critical for the benefit sharing approach to work in, uh, to work in any uh, uh, river basin. When it comes to the Nile, you know, you have two downstream countries who are struggling to maintain a colonial based privilege, which unfortunately defranchise uh, all the water source countries, and as the doctor was, uh, Dr. Som was explaining in his presentation, even the title, Agreement between the United Arab Republic and the Republic of Sudan for the full utilization of the water. The entire water, the mean annual flow is allocated between three entities, Egypt, Sudan, and evaporation at the Sahara Desert because of the highest under. In such a situation, if we are trying to bring in benefit sharing, you know, this is what they are saying. Ethiopia, you are good for uh, hydropower. You have the deep and uh, narrow gorge. You produce electricity, Sudan. You have the vast land where the sky is the limit. Uh, they will produce agricultural products and the remaining water will flow to Egypt. And then an Ethiopian who is thirsty, an Ethiopian who is hungry, to cultivate land to, for irrigation as well, or for any other purpose, consumptive purpose, Ethiopia is not allowed to do so. So the bringing the benefit sharing approach in the Nile Basin at this time would simply institutionalize and legalize the uh, colonial based uh, uh, monopolistic uh, approach by Egypt and Sudan. So the solution is, as Dr. Samu rightly said, the solution is to finalize the CFA process, establish the Nile Basin Commission, nullify the uh, colonial uh, legacies in the basin, and uh, we'll have the Nile Basin Commission. We will agree on who gets what, when and how, and then the benefit, uh, the benefit sharing approach comes in. Thank you, Prof. Yeah, I agree with you. I think when they wake up in the morning, they have to say that the Nile water belongs to the 11 basin countries. And that water has to be shared equitably and fairly. They have to start the day with yeah, that. Can I add one thing? That's insight, yeah. Okay, go ahead, Sam. Uh, there is one <clears throat> dilemma has created a, a multi-layer challenge in the Nile basin. When uh, uh, upstream countries like Ethiopia would have been part of the negotiation 30, 40 years ago, uh, the population was like 30 million, uh, 40, 50 years ago. And the, the population factor is extraordinary in the Nile Basin. It adds additional layer of complicating uh, agreements. So it's easier to sign uh, agreements 10 years, 20 years ago than today. It's, it is better to sign cooperative agreement today and start what uh, Atuzarun said, uh, than staying another 10 or 20 years. Things would, uh, uncertainties would increase. Uh, at the same time, the population increase adds additional dimension to the negotiations. So I think like uh, Asafa said, uh, people in the basin should, should write in the morning and say, this basin is for 11 countries, let's bring uh, the best out of it, uh, that we have all the same uh, destiny, human destiny, and we should also uh, have uh, share the same resource, the same happiness from that resource. That is the only way. We'd, otherwise, continuing with Darwinian instinct of uh, survival in the 21st century, this is simply uh, instinct based on the fittest and the survival uh, theory of Darwinian. 
Whereas now we are stepping from this into what we call a human approach. We are cooperative, flexible human beings that we should share the resource we have. So I think the narrative should, should, should be beyond uh, what we have used to in the 20th century, where this theory of Darwinian has brought first world war, second world war, and the world world was in chaos. So we have to step from that out and find a solution. We are human beings that we can find a solution. There is no way other than uh, getting into that win-lose situation anymore. People are awakening every, every time. Uh, the water curve, the water knowledge curve, I remember Anna wrote a water knowledge curve, which was 40, 50 years, was different. Now the water knowledge curve in the basin is smoothing out. We know the information. We know what's going on. The world knows it. So I think with that remark, uh, we have to really uh, engage in, in that direction. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Samu. Uh, I mean, I agree with you. I think one of the best things that happened to the lower basin countries is GERD. Uh, I know you might disagree with me, but GERD is... Uh, an assurance that water will flow across the boundary because they have a, a $5 billion project being built over there. So water has to go downstream into the dam. And then of course, after that, it's close to the boundaries to Sudan and Egypt. So, uh, I mean, I would say this is a binding agreement with an agreement. So GERD will ensure that water will flow across the boundary. So I think this is a good project. This is something that can benefit everybody, particularly the three basin countries. And it is time to get together. As Samu said, the longer we wait, the more unknown variables, complicating variables will emerge. More demand would actually uh, come into picture, more uncertainty, climate change, water uh, supply might uh, dwindle for a number of reasons. I think it's time for the countries to come together. There are concessions, I, as, I, as, I, as I always said, but it is a good thing to do it earlier than wait uh, for another few years. I think with that, uh, it's now almost 10 o'clock. We started at 8 o'clock, a few minutes after 8 o'clock. Thank you very much uh, for coming. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Samu, for uh, doing it a very awkward way of, uh, you know, through relay your presentations. Uh, I think we have to really talk about how we can uh, avoid these types of uh, problems in the future. But I always thank everybody. You know, I can see Katama and also uh, Professor Shismons from Australia, he was actually late in the night over there. And also I see a lot of you from, uh, from East Africa and the Nile Basin countries. I'm very happy, but send us a comment. I know uh, I couldn't do really as much as I want to uh, bring people from Egypt and Sudan. We send equal invitations. Uh, I have uh, a large list of uh, emails in my list server but I was able to actually only, maybe the timing is an issue, but if you feel that, you know, you can access uh, and send or share our announcement to others, please do so. Or if you believe that you know someone who can give a good presentation along within the scope of our, this webinar, please let me know. You can, uh, you can reach out to me. Uh, Candice already posted our email in the chat. You can send to Candice or to myself. And I'll make some announcement that we are planning a big conference also in the coming November. I will uh, send an announcement uh, soon. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, hopefully we'll see you uh, on July 20th. There is a presentation uh, scheduled. Uh, and then once we finalize that, we'll announce it. Thank you very much again. Have a good evening and have a good day for, for some of you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, mm -hmm. Samu.